If you've ever wondered what it was like in the wild, wild west, don't worry, you're not alone. I can't say I've ever thought of being like a western gal, but after watching stereotypes come to life in old movies, I'm quite curious about the truth versus the fiction. Let's lasso up some facts together, shall we? Please don't click off, I promise I'll stop with the bad jokes. When a story attracted public anger, some settlers in the west were quick to take the law into their own hands. These vigilantes were idolized in popular contemporary accounts, but the justice they served was often brutal and inhumane by most standards. Not content with apprehension and execution, most vigilantes physically tormented any accused. Some folks even took trophies. In 1891, the skin of a sentenced bandit was tanned and made into souvenirs. It's definitely more unique than the usual tacky magnets or door signs, I'll give them that. Vigilantes justified their acts by pointing to the terrible acts that the accused had allegedly committed. Yeah, but to quote my dad, two wrongs don't make a right. Even when the accused were caught and were waiting for trial, vigilante squads didn't always have the patience to wait for a legal sentence or risk an acquittal. Instead, they showed up at the jail and demanded to deal with the offenders themselves. In one 1878 incident, an accused killer was caught, taken to jail, with a trial scheduled for the next day. But during that night, 20 or 30 masked men arrived with weapons in hand and took the man away to deliver their own immediate justice. How? Well, they killed this guy by way of the rope necklace of death. Look, that guy probably wasn't long for this world anyways, since most convictions at the time ended in executions. The life expectancy of somebody who broke the law in the wild, wild west often decreased dramatically after conviction, especially for those accused of taking another person's life. Whether offenders received an official trial, or one carried out by the unsanctioned vigilantes, folks demanded justice. In California, offenders were convicted in very quick trials and usually met the end of their life at the county courthouse. Execution usually came shortly after conviction, as appeals and stays of execution were uncommon. If an expected execution did not happen or did not occur quickly enough for the crowd, that's where you've got your vigilantes that I was speaking about a moment ago. I know in one 1851 case, vigilantes convicted a man of stealing gold dust and gave him a simple little three hours to get his affairs in order before they ended his life. Like, I don't know about you, but that's not enough time to get my affairs in order. I have too much junk. Law enforcement was still a job during vigilante time, but death in the line of duty was pretty likely. The West had a variety of legitimate lawmen, ranging from town sheriffs and marshals to the U.S. Marshals appointed by the Attorney General. U.S. Marshals were charged with maintaining federal law, and they could deputize local men to form a posse when greater numbers were necessary. And during this period, deaths in the line of duty were kind of common. The U.S. Marshals alone had several deadly incidents. In 1872, a marshal and seven members of his posse were fatally harmed when they tried to take a prisoner from the custody of another court. In 1885, a deputy marshal and three members of his posse engaged in a deadly firing exchange. A prisoner escape claimed the lives of a deputy marshal and two posse members in 1887. Another did the same to two deputy marshals and one posse member in 1893. The West still holds a lot of records for the deadliest incidents involving multiple law enforcement casualties. Not records I want to see broken anytime soon, mind you. Contrary to what you might think after all that, many towns did indeed try to enforce weapon control and restrictions. The Wild West had no shortage of fireable weapons, creating a worrying situation for lawmen trying to prevent violent offenses. Towns like Tombstone, Arizona, and Dodge City, Kansas required visitors to surrender their weapons whenever they entered the town. In fact, the 1881 firing exchange event at the OK Corral started as a conflict over Billy Clanton and the McLaurie brothers refusing to give up their weapons when they entered Tombstone. Anyone defying a western town's weapon control laws was likely to meet a violent end. Author and cowboy Andy Adams describes the laws of Dodge City in his account published in 1903. The buffalo hunters and rangemen have protested against the iron rule of Dodge's peace officers, and nearly every protest has cost human life. Don't ever get the impression that you can ride your horses into a saloon or fire out the lights in Dodge. It may go somewhere else, but it don't go there. Most cowboys think it's an infringement on their rights to give up firing in town. And if it is, it stands. For your weapons are no match for Winchesters and Buckshot. And Dodge's officers are as game a set of men as ever faced danger. Look, I know weapons control is something law enforcement still struggles to enforce till this day, so interesting to see how that goes. So even with law enforcement being a thing, corruption was kind of rampant. The West had many problems with vigilante justice, but the legitimate lawmen were sometimes not much better. Many law enforcement officers were not consistently paid, earning money only through taking a percentage of fines or collecting bounties on wanted men. In desperate times, some 
lawmen turn to crime themselves, making corruption a big problem. Sheriff Dave Allison was accused several times of misappropriation of money. Henry Newton Brown was a deputy sheriff tasked with tracking people for a bounty, but on his bounty hunt, he robbed a bank with three accomplices. A vigilante mob took matters into their own hands, though, enacting fatal punishment. So he did get punished, quote unquote. Timothy Longhair Jim Courtright used his position in law enforcement to run a protection racket that extorted profits from gambling dens and saloons. He died in a duel with somebody else, though. Who else? Oh, just a saloon owner who refuses protection. Sadly, racism was a big influence for a lot of crime and crime punishments. In 1862, a period of famine and encroaching white settlement led to conflict between the Sante Sioux and the U.S. military under the direction of General John Pope. When the conflict ended a few months later, hundreds of indigenous folks were taken prisoner and sentenced to death in military trials that lasted around 10 minutes each, so not really long. Most of these prisoners were convicted on the basis of being present when the fighting ended. Which great, let's kill all of our bystanders for no reason. Military authorities wanted to execute all 303 people who were convicted, but President Abraham Lincoln was concerned with distinguishing between individual acts and group warfare, and how executing prisoners of war would look to foreign powers. He approved the execution of only 38 prisoners in the end, still making it the largest mass execution in U.S. history. This was far from the end of indiscriminate executions, as the U.S. government enforced increasingly dehumanizing policies. Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan fought against indigenous groups, viewing those conflicts with the same attitude of total war that they had adopted during the Civil War. Under their direction, the military destroyed entire villages, with Sherman ordering his soldiers to kill everybody in a village and burn it down. And that's just the official folks. Vigilante justice was inherently subject to the biases of the public, which often led to the racially motivated selection of targets. And the West was no exception, with plenty of ethnic minorities considered the other and regarded as a threat by white settlers. So folks who were Hispanic, indigenous, and Chinese were frequent targets of vigilante acts. In 1878, Juan de la Cruz was accused of attacking a woman and a young human, well, you know, Boozing. The victims were unharmed in the incident, but public anger turned against La Cruz and a mob seized the attacker from jail and he met his way by the end of the rope necklace. When the body was found, one witness reportedly said, You've done a good job, you reformers. Now, why don't you hang the man who sold the whiskey to the Indian? His words, not mine, but it just gives you an idea of how things were at the time. Ever heard of army camels? So in 1855, the US Army decided to import camels to Texas. The wide open spaces of the West were well suited for them, so they were like, Yeah, let's bring in 75 camels from the Middle East. They worked at Cam Camp Verde, where they made supply runs to San Antonio. But a few years later, the Civil War disrupted the service when a government official decided to auction off the animal, and the new owner sent some of them to Nevada, some to California, and other ones were just sort of set free. Now, at first, you didn't really see them around. But in the 1880s, Arizona Territory faced a terrible menace known as the Red Ghost. What did it do? Well, it trampled one woman, whereas another story claimed the monster ate a grizzly bear. When miners spotted the Red Ghost and fired at it, a human skull fell from the creature's back. After years of terror terrorizing Arizona, eventually it was taken out. What was it? Just a feral camel. Now camel sightings on the west continued into the 20th century. It's just so wild. Like imagine just going about your day, damn, a camel. <laughs> <laughs> Time to talk about a famous criminal. Billy the Kid was wanted in 1881 for shooting a sheriff in Nebraska and another man in a New Mexico saloon. Running from a $500 bounty on his head, he was eventually trapped and put on trial. And it didn't go the way he wanted. The judge found Billy guilty, saying the outlaw would hang until he was dead, dead, dead. Billy responded, you can go to hell, hell, hell. How poetic. This date with the gallows set, Billy pulled off a daring escape. On April 28th of 1881, he asked the deputy guarding his jail cell to take him to the outhouse. Once free from the cell, the outlaw pulled off his handcuffs, took the deputy's firearm, and did away with the deputy. Knowing the sheriff would be after him, Billy hid on the roof of the courthouse. When the sheriff ran up, Billy yelled, look up, old boy, and see what you get, and then fired on the sheriff. His escape nearly complete, he took a horse and hit the road and got away. Well, that time. We all know how the rest of the story played out. Beauty families were a doozy and a half back in the day. The Kentucky-West Virginia border's world-famous Hatfield and McCoy families weren't the only notorious feuding clans of the old days. In fact, the Old West had a feud that went even further than that infamous incident. After the Civil War, Texas had two families, the Suttons and the Taylors, who really didn't like each other. The feud started when Buck Taylor fired at and killed a Sutton Alley in 1866, then escalated with the deaths of Taylor and a man named Dick Chisholm. Two years later, in a horse sale gone wrong. Taylor's remaining family members 
dug in their heels. They had Southern pride and were mad about the Confederacy losing decisively in the Civil War. The Suttons, meanwhile, had the backing of local Texas militia members and state police outfits that were keen on Reconstruction. The Sutton family's patriarch, William, took control of the police himself by 1869, running raids across the state to ferret out cattle wrestlers sympathetic to the Taylors. Over the next five years, all of DeWitt County, Texas, was plunged into a horrifically violent feud. Even members of other families were forced to take sides and choose. Those who didn't offer allegiance risked being killed. Then again, those who did pick a team were killed in skirmishes and senseless violence as well. By 1874, so many people had died in DeWitt County that the Texas Rangers finally rode in and worked for months to ease tensions. They were mostly unsuccessful, but by the end of 1875, the feud started to slow down. And it wasn't because of anybody's really great negotiating skills. It was just because the most aggressive and vicious participants on each side had met their end. Because of everything else I've already covered today, it should come as a surprise to nobody that homicide rates in the Wild West were extremely high, rivaled only by the violence of the American South during the Civil War and Reconstruction. An adult living in Dodge City, Kansas from 1876 to 1885 stood a 1 in 61 chance of not surviving. If you lived in San Francisco, you had a 1 in 203 chance of a similarly rough end. And if you lived in other counties in California, eh, 1 in 72. Oregon? Mm, 1 in 208. Still not great, but not awful. The Old West had some wild hygienics and some that may or may not make sense. For example, not all beds in the American West were made of straw and hay, but many were. Such bedding wasn't changed often, leading to infestations by lice and other critters. Lice, or seam squirrels, were just one of the troublesome groups of insects that could make life in the Wild West less than hygienic. If you were a soldier during the Wild West times, our mattresses at the early frontier army posts consist of a cotton bag stuffed with straw, which was nicknamed Prairie Feathers. The straw was supposedly to be changed once a month and files found that their way into food stuffings and human waste. Mosquitoes flocked into poorly insulated buildings and as one member named Rose Pender, a visitor to the American West from 1883 to 1888 recalled one night when she tried to sleep, bugs abounded, I got very little rest. That was her Yelp review, she gave 3 out of 5 stars. Very few people had screens on windows so bugs would make their way into homes and outhouses and back again, leaving remnants of whatever they picked up along the way. Not to mention, you'd have to have a chamber pot as indoor plumbing was not utilized or invented efficiently enough in the Wild West, so you can imagine if you didn't throw out your waste from your chamber pot, considering it was under your bed, it would attract even more insects, bugs, and intensify the acidic odors and smells. Back in the Wild West, people had to get creative when it came to bathroom business as toilet paper wasn't a thing for a long time, so they had to resort into using corn cobs, torn pages from magazines, and catalogs. It wasn't until 1857 that Joseph Gaty introduced the medicated paper, but it was sold individually not on rolls, meaning like one sheet each one. Roll South toilet paper didn't arrive until 1890 along with the invention of the toilet paper holder. Dust storms were a formidable and unavoidable aspect of life in the 1800s American West, and the severity of these storms as recorded in journals and diaries often led to eye irritation, respiratory issues, and even livestock fatalities. The pervasiveness of dust and inside homes posed continuous challenges to settlers affecting their health and living conditions. The impact of this dust storms offers a vivid portrayal of the harsh environmental conditions faced by settlers. It emphasizes the constant battle against natural elements and the resilience required to adapt and survive in each of this challenging landscape. And if you were a cowboy, you might come into town smelling of sweat, dust, blood, or just constantly smelling the way you smell, which included smelling like a horse. The tolerance of such strong odors in public spaces reflected the period, different attitudes towards personal hygiene and social norms, and it underscores the hardship of the cowboy life where practicalities often overruled concerns for cleanliness. Cowboys of the Wild West, after long stretches on horseback, often carried with them a distinctive and pungent horse odor. The scent often became particularly noticeable when close quarters were made, especially in local bars where cowboys gathered for refreshments, and bartenders, those poor guys, were more concerned of the profit than the smell comfort paid by little minds of their patrons stink as long as they had money. The aspect of a cowboy life offers a realistic glimpse into the less romanticized day-to-day -day realities of the era, where personal hygiene often took a backseat to the demands of frontier living. And so when it came to showering or bathing, the popularity of public baths reflect on the social and economic realities of the time, where communal solutions were often the only viable options for personal hygiene. It also highlights the challenges of maintaining cleanliness in an era before modern plumbing and sanitation. In the Wild West, public baths emerge as a popular solution for the majority who lacked private bathing facilities. So these communal bathhouses, often through a symbol of cleanliness and socialization, often meant sharing close quarters and even the same bath water with others. 
other people. Given the rudimentary nature of soaps at the time, these baths could paradoxically expose patrons to more dirt and bacteria from fellow bathers than they had removed. And so, in the Wild West, the lack of antiseptics and unsanitary conditions made even more minor injuries potentially fatal. A simple cut or abrasion could escalate into a serious infection or disease, with settlers especially vulnerable on the trail. This reality emphasizes the constant dangers faced in daily life, where even trivial wounds pose significant health risks. The threat of diseases like cholera from such injuries underlines the harshness of the era and the importance of caution and self care. It also highlights the limitation of medical knowledge and practices of the time, contributing to the high mortality rates from what we know now easily are treatable conditions. While numbing the pain was a priority, the only solace came in in the form of a sweet gulp of whiskey. And the lack of essential dental care resources meant oral hygiene also took a backseat to survival, and a pristine smile was a very rare gem. Toothbrushes were a luxury, and brushing one's teeth was an afterthought for many. And it gets worse, because it always does. When faced with dental issues like cavity or root canals, the remedies were far from sophisticated. Brace yourself as the favorite method was just simply getting barbers and even blacksmiths acting like makeshift dentists and just extracting your offended tooth with pliers. Women in the Wild West were often more eh, constituous about personal hygiene with their male count counterparts, or more than their male counterparts. Despite the challenges of privacy and limited resources, many women made effort to wash regularly using nearby rivers and streams for basic cleanliness. This practice, alongside the advantage of being indoors, more often allowed them to maintain a higher level of personal hygiene compared to men. This gender difference in hygiene and hygienic practices showcases the early recognition of the importance of cleanliness among women, and it highlights their role in setting standards for personal care, even in a time where bathing and washing were not as so common in a practice. Number five. Banking. Today, online banking is super easy, but back in the old west days, you didn't get a courtesy email, you didn't have overdraft, nothing like that. In fact, the United States national banking system didn't even exist until 1863. So what happened before then? Are we just hiding our money in our underwear? What are we doing? Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And these wildcat banks would take deposits for a short amount of time, and then unannounced, out of nowhere, they would run. They would disappear overnight with all of your money, everything, your whole life savings. Gone. They did the long con. They played the long game. They were actors. So you're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? That's almost impressive. They'd have the fake mustache. Oh, good morning, sir. I'm sign here, please. <laughs> they lied. They faked it for months. They just lied for months and then dipped out of nowhere. Thankfully, after 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank and, you know, not steal everybody's money. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these big names, they all gained trust over time because of these fake loony tune banks. You imagine, how do you not break character? You're like, okay, and that's you all set up. They're like, we got it, we got it, go. Number four, seam squirrels. Nothing to do with squirrels before you get upset. Here we go. During the Old West era, personal hygiene was not a priority for many people. And lice infestations were all too common. Nice, now I'm itchy doing this list, love that. The type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which could be, well, obviously found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. I got some squirrels on my body, nice, that's great. So itchy, so disgusting. Body lice was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, relapsing fever, all the fevers, any fever just coming your way, right into your mouth and eyes, horrible. These diseases were often fatal, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. So to combat the spread of lice and the diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely bald. Bunch of bald cowboys. Bunch of naked bald cowboys walking around being like, where's my money? I thought this was a bank. Number three, resurrectionalist. While Boot Hill sees folks going into the ground, a resurrectionalist was responsible for the exact opposite. Yeah, bring them back up. We actually made a mistake. Get that guy back out of there. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools for like $9. It was really disgusting. Now, this was the late 1820s, and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, believe it or not, the medical science community was on the up and up, so this was needed for that to work. But in order to study new medicines and, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed these guys. They needed these resurrectionalists to rise the dead, like they're a White Walker in Game of Thrones. 
Jones. I don't know, that's what I imagine in my head. Would you rather work a boot hill type job or would you rather get paid to dig up bodies? Put them in or take them out? Comment down below. Both are so horrible, couldn't imagine picking. Number two, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, the old Western saloons, kicking in those crazy doors, we imagine some catchphrases and whiskey and all that fun stuff. Everyone's loud, it's Peaky Blinders, whatever. No, not at all. It was the exact opposite of fun. The bartender would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead because he's uh, an alcoholic and also that's super illegal. Back in the Wild West days, you could do whatever you want. You could drink what you want, you could serve what you want. Anything goes. Bartenders also had no regulations to follow behind that sketchy bar. So not only was it very high proof, but some bevies like tarantula juice would just straight up kill you. Yeah, if its name didn't tip you off, if you're drinking tarantula juice, it's cause it's made with poisonous ingredients. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine, and if you drink it, well, you'll feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. Huh, how fun is that, cool. Which button do I press to not tip? Thanks so much. Number one, medical shows. Today, medical shows are fascinating. Even on YouTube, Dr. Pimple Popper, are you kidding me? I, I can gag all day and watch that, it's the best. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s to the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen. Now these guys, these showstoppers, they would show up in your town selling elixirs and tonics because everyone needed one, of course. Everyone needs to live a happy and comfortable life, but they were full of lies. Don't listen to these guys, all right? These professional medicinal showmen would have have pawns run ahead, stay in your town, and then wait. They would plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixir shows began. So they'd call up random audience members, one of these being their buddy, and then these magical elixirs would treat their ailments just like that. What an amazing show. I'm in. I'm going to buy this immediately. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was said to treat any illness back in the day. But in reality, it was an extremely strong laxative. So imagine finding that out on the way home. You're like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm exploding out of my body. What's going on? I don't think that worked back there. Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws, like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with his crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. Yeah, that's real, That's that happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels. Things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, how fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat, or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders, and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away, so the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that you know go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. 
Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west of the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed The Brick, Okay. He apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was show. They had this one drink on bar rail called Tarantula Juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday. Go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh. Yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. With gambling as super apparent in saloons as it was also useful pastime, it was also a risk if you were a cheat, and you might also have to cheat death, because <laughs> you're, you're not supposed to do that. Some, like the weapon fight at the OK Corral, were the outcome of long simmering feuds and rivalries, but most were the result of confrontation between outlaws laws and law enforcement. Although in movies, televisions would like to us believe otherwise, it was very rare when pew pew fights occurred with the two standing fighters off squarely facing one another from a distance in a dusty street. They would just knock your butt out. The romanticized image of the Old West style fight was born in the dime novels of the late 19th century and perpetuated in film era to make such a point that this fiction version of what our mind's eye quickly conjures up when we hear the word weapon fight. You know what I mean. In actuality, the real fights of the Old West were actually so rarely civilized that yes, we might have heard some of these famed robber criminals like sharpshooters like Billy the Kid, Calamity Jane, Jesse James, and Annie Oakley, they wouldn't really wait. You know, unlike Clint Eastwood films. It was probably more rotted than it was organized, and the Wild West saloons were also known for its culture of its violence. Weapon slingers and outlaws, as I mentioned, often frequent these establishments, and disputes were often settled with a handheld weapon fight. Even saloon owners would also provide their own weapons for their patrons, and saloons itself would become a battleground during an open fire fight. Saloons would also appear in every town and were your average pit stop on a long journey, and if you're a man who hasn't seen or felt the touch of a woman in a very long time, and you can afford it, he might stop by to a certain saloon for a drink and quench whatever thirsty self you might be craving. Like a gentleman's club, most Wild West saloons catered almost exclusively to the white men in the frontier. Although women could sometimes find work in the bars as dance hall girls or workers of the evening. But of course, you have the madam of the house making sure the security of her girls are okay, but when it comes to money and gold rushes, it was pretty much more valuable than the average person's life. Respectable women didn't frequent Wild West saloons, but women who were less concerned about their reputations might find work there. Many saloon girls were widows and had no other means of support or young girls girls who were seeking something more than working on their family farm. They wanted adventure, if you know what I mean. The girls were to dance with the men and get the men to buy them drinks, earning as much as $10 per week, which is pretty a lot for back then. Most saloon girls also made commissions from the drinks they sold, and whiskey sold to the customers were generally marked up to 30 to 60% over its wholesale price. But like all dames who worked in these type of eras, were definitely in her bag as her status would be noted and gossiped throughout town. One famous saloon girl was also named Fanny Porter. Fanny's family arrived in Texas when she was just one years old immigrating from England. Growing up as both an immigrant and the middle of the Wild West may have inspired her to enter the sporting life as she took up the trade as a teenager and opened up her own brothel at the age of 20 in San Antonio. In some ways though, these saloons would have been another term for these women of the night to rebrand themselves as cantina girls. However, despite themselves and the services they provide, their life expectancies were actually short in a typical night. And I'm not just talking about in case, you know, someone 
does something to them. It was because of the drinking. A woman may have to have consumed up to 30 beers a night. An average lifespan of a woman in the katina trade was less than a decade. Like as in current times in Japan, they also have these host clubs that if you go and meet these very handsome and beautiful people, you would also be forced to drink with them. And like the cantina girls back in the wild west, a lot of these people would suffer a lot of liver issues, which means cantina girls still exist today, just not where we are well known of. And since I mentioned it was so dirty, they'd even bring their horses in the saloon, like the idea of the wild west. The wild west and anyone could do anything they want, that also included bringing your horse inside of the bar to take a selfie with. Like in this photo, where the men of the saloon located in Utah took their horse to be part of the group chat profile pic, and I think my favorite part of this photo is how the bartender is also posing. But despite how gross it was back then, even part of the historical tourist attractions, there are some saloons still open and even in operation today. Saloons like the White Elephant in Fort Worth, Texas, was one of the more than 60 Wild West saloons in the city, and at the end of the 19th century, it is actually still open today for functioning, I'll bet in a different building. But it still holds a lot of significance as it holds a lot of memento, part of American Western history. Number 10, Pearl Hart. Pearl Hart was a notorious figure in the American Wild West, known for involvement in a stagecoach robbery. Her life story is often intertwined with the tales of the Old West and the outlaws who sought adventure and fortune during that era. Pearl Hart, whose real name was Pearl Taylor, was born in Canada in 1871, but was later moved to the United States and became involved in various activities, including acting and singing. In 1899, Pearl Hart and a companion, Joe Boot, decided to rob a stagecoach in Arizona. The stagecoach was en route from the globe to Florence, carrying passengers and valuables. The stagecoach robbery did not go as planned, as Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were not experienced criminals, and their attempt was somewhat amateurish. They failed to obtain a significant amount of loot and after the failed robbery, Pearl and Joe was captured by law enforcement. They were then later arrested and brought to trial and Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were tried for their crimes. During the trial, Pearl presented herself as a victim of circumstances, arguing that she had committed the robbery due to personal circumstances. She was convicted and sentenced to only 5 years in prison. As for Joe, nobody knows. Pearl's Hart's life after her release from prison remains somewhat of a mystery. After serving about 2 years of her sentence, she was released due to good behavior and Pearl Hart's belief was dramatic stint as a stagecoat robber contributed to her lasting notoriety as the annals of Wild West history. Her story became a part of a lore surrounding outlaws and characteristics of American frontier. Number 9. Laura Bullion was also known as the Rose of the Wild Bunch. She was a female outlaw associated with the Wild Bunch Gang, a notorious group of American outlaws led by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid during the late 19th and early 20th century. Laura Bullion was born in Knickerbocker, Texas in 1876. Her family moved to the mining town of Moab, Utah where she grew up. Laura became acquainted with the members of the Wild Bunch, including Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and then other notorious outlaws. She developed a romantic relationship with Kid Curry, a member of the gang, and Laura Bullion participated in various criminal activities with the Wild Bunch, including train and bank robberies. She was also known for her sharp shooting skills and her involvement in the gang's illegal enterprises. In 1901, Laura was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri for her involvement in a train robbery. She was sentenced to five years in prison, but only served about three, and after her release from prison, Laura Bullion tried to lead a more law-abiding life. She lived under an assumed name in Memphis, Tennessee, working as a housekeeper. Laura Bullion then passed away on December 2nd, 1961 in Memphis, Tennessee, at the age of 85, and her death was largely unnoticed by the public. Number 8. There is a limited historical information about Belle Sidions, who is also known as Madame Vestal. She was a figure associated with the American Old West during the late 19th century, particularly in the realms of entertainment and the infamous red light districts of frontier towns. Belle Sidions was reportedly an entertainer and an actress who performed in various theatrical productions and shows during the late 18th but later in her life, Belle Sidians adopted the alias Madame Vestals and became known for her role as Madame, managing establishments and red light districts. These areas were known for housing brothels and establishments that provided various forms of entertainment. During the late 19th century, the American West would experience rapid growth with numerous people seeking fortune and adventures in newly settled areas, as well as red light districts. The presence of the red light districts, saloons, and entertainment venues catered to the needs of this transient population that was very common. Like many individuals associated with the red light districts of the Old West, the details of Belle Sidians' life remain somewhat elusive and separating the fact that a legend can be challenging. Nevertheless, figures like Madame Vestals contribute to the colorful and diverse tapestry of the Old West societal history. Number 7. Rose Dunn, also known as the Rose of the Cameron, was a legendary figure associated with the American Old West. Born in 1878, Rose Dunn gained notoriety for her romantic entanglements with outlaws and her involvement in the activities of the Wild Bunch Gang. Hmm. Rose Dunn was also born
born in Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma in 1878. She came from a large family, and her brothers were also known for their involvement in outlaw activities. Rose Dunn then became romantically involved with George Bitter Creek Newcomb, a member of the Wild Bunch gang led by Bill Doolin. The Wild Bunch was notorious for its involvement in train and bank robberies, as we know. In 1895, a shootout occurred in the Dunn family ranch involving lawmen seeking to capture Dunn brothers and their associates. During the confrontation, Rose's brother John Dunn was killed, and her older brother George Dunn was captured after the death of Bitter Creek Newcomb. Rose Dunn then lived more of a settled life, and she married Charles Albert Noble, a farmer, and they had a family. Rose and Charles lived in Catheridge, Missouri. Rose Dunn then passed away on February 5th, 1955, in Parachute, Colorado. Number six, Sarah Jane Newman was born in Tennessee in 1817 and later moved to Texas. Also known as Sally Skull or Sally Skull, was a figure associated with the Texas frontier during the mid 19th century. Her life story involves elements of violence, crime, and romance, contributing to her notoriety in the history of the American West. Sarah married George Washington Skull, a Texan and a participant in the Texan War of Independence. George Skull operated a ferry and owned a ranch in a location known as Skull Crossing in the San Antonio River. The crossing was an important point for travelers and cattle drives, as the Skull family became involved in violent feuds with the Taylor family over land and cattle. This feud escalated and resulted in several killings on both sides. With also casualties in 1867 during the height of the feud, Scally Skull was widowed after her husband George Skull was killed. Following his death, she sought out revenge and killed several members of the Taylor family. And after the killing, Sally Skull was captured and imprisoned. She was definitely tried for the deaths, but was charged or dropped due to insufficient evidence. And after her release, Sally Skull's life became less eventful as she lived in relatively obscurity and passed away in 1888. Number five, Romeo and Juliet. What's it a name that which we call a rose? Any other word would smell as sweet. It's often said that art imitates life, but sometimes life can be stranger than fiction, and oftentimes really similar. The Hatfield and McCoys were two feuding families in the time of the Old West, whose hatred of one another runs deep. The most serious issues being family members removed Old West style by the opposite family, and in one case, a court battle over the ownership of a barnyard pig. But perhaps the best story to come of this feud is the love affair of John C. Hatfield and Rosanna McCoy. The two lovers met and instantly fell in love with each other, their families instantly disapproving of their newfound love. Similar to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the star-crossed lover's story ends in tragedy. After multiple attempts to rekindle their love, including a daring rescue organized by Rosanna to free John C. from her own family, their love never re-sparked and Jauncey went on to marry her cousin. It's said that poor Rosanna died of a broken heart. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves my cousin. Number four, bank robberies. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, you need a hat, and you need a big sack with a dollar sign on it. Apparently, wasn't it like Bandit Central? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner in every dusty old town? Uh, no, there actually was very little, in fact. Bank robberies didn't happen that often back then. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were around 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. So it got a lot worse after the Wild Wild West. Now we're on like Wild Wild Wild, it's like 70 wilds at this point. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw, you may have heard of them, Jesse James and his brother Frank. This was in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. We know all these bandits, but it's like they're just, they're just robbers, they're just bad people. We shouldn't really know them or glorify them, but they do this and ride horses, so it's kind of fun. And the number three spot, Good Bad Town. On your way out west, you may come to find that the unsettled lands are full of danger, bandits, crooks, perilous weather and the occasional tummy ache. When the town of Palisade, Nevada's railroad was expanded and people began to arrive in droves, the town boomed, but so did their boredom. Palisade was rather mild compared to the rest of the expanding west, so much so that when tourists began to complain of Palisade being nothing like the dangerous towns they read about in their dime novels, the people of Palisade acted by staging fake bank robberies, gunfights, and even Native American battles between them and the army, with sometimes the Native Americans participating. Also going as far as using real cattle blood during the stage combat. The citizens of Palisade were such effective actors that a lot of tourists began to run back to the train in fear of what they were seeing. Nothing more American than capitalizing on boredom. Number two, Helena Duels. Have you guys heard of Helena Duels? They're pretty intense, and they're a bit more intense than breakdancing battles, which honestly it's pretty close, but these are like right above it. Helena Duels began, of course, in Helena, Texas, aka the toughest town on earth. At least that's what they called it back in the late 1800s. It still is pretty close. The Helena Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They showed this style of combat in a pretty brutal cinematic way. Opponents left hands were tied together with buckskin and each were given a small little blade. It had to be short enough so you couldn't reach any vital organ. That was the trick. It was a brutal detail that made this an unusual event. But just like the Romans, 
Athens and the Colosseum, everybody likes watching violence. Depending what era it is, people are like, yeah, we'll still show up and watch people die, sure. People would make bets during these duels. How did anybody watch these at all? I can't even scroll through Reddit at night without seeing something awful, let alone a Helena duel at like 4 p.m. And the number one spot. I don't like your snoring, partner. There were a handful of dangerous criminals back in the Wild West. This includes John Wesley Harden. Born to a reverend in 1853, his parents hoped he would grow up to be a preacher. He turned out to be one of the most deadliest outlaws to ever live. Harden claimed many lives over the years, but most bizarre was when he shot a man for snoring. One night in 1871, while staying at a hotel, Harden was having trouble sleeping due to the man in the next room snoring loudly. Harden promptly shouted at the man to stop snoring. Irritated with no response, he fired several shots into the next room, claiming the man's life. After years of being an outlaw and spending a lot of time in jail, he was released for good behavior, where he then received a full pardon. With his full pardon, Harden was then able to take and pass the bar exam, afterwards setting up a law practice in Gonzales County, Texas. If your lawyer has a longer criminal history than you, there's a good chance you're not gonna beat the case. Kicking off the list at number 10, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s? That's why we clicked this video, right? That's all we wanna know. Some beers today cost like $13 at the bar. What's going on? Nowadays we have happy hour, drink specials, wine pairing suggestions that go along with your meal. We have affordable alternatives today at the bar. Back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel to get there. Isn't that wild? In the Yukon, their shots of whiskey were like 50 cents a pop. That was, that was a lot of money back in the day. If you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, you could get numerous beverages for the same price. And as you would expect, the fancier the establishment, the more you'll spend. But either way, it's not gonna be comfortable. Number nine, manure everywhere. The 1800s were changing times, especially on the Western frontier. Cities were being built, America was under reconstruction, and if you see my video on the 1800s technology, then you know how things were about to get a little wild. Except, something I wanna talk about today is, well, it's gonna drive moms and wives nuts across the country. How many times have you told your husband or the kids to wipe off their feet before coming into the house? Or stop wearing their shoes in the house? Right? It's the worst! I'm sorry, Mom. Okay, but imagine that, except everyone is bringing in their muddy, bloody, and manure-covered boots into the house. Horses and livestock were just a part of everyday life. That means droppings, or road apples, as they're so commonly called. The smell alone on a hot summer day could make any cowboy turn green. I think I'm going to pew, Dad! <laughs> Number eight, no stools. Okay, this one's for all the bartenders out there. I see you. I respect you. Bar seating is vital. You get your regulars coming in. Joan with the limp, she's so nice. She's always so nice every day. Always gets a grilled cheese. She's the best, always a smile on her face. Individuals who wanna grab a bite and read the paper, obviously they don't need to take up an entire table for eight, so you have spots at the bar. It's ideal, we're used to this. But back in the Western days, bar stools, just weren't a thing. Bar spots weren't, it, was, it didn't exist. You couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. They didn't have stools at the bar, they just had the rail at the bottom for your foot. Just that little bar rail there for the little lean right there. A nice cowboy lean. Yeah, I'll just eat fish and chips standing up leaning. Awesome, just the thing you want after walking in the sun all day long. A foot rail. Number seven, duels at high noon. Let me paint a picture for you, partner. It's a warm summer night, and you find yourself sitting at a card table in a saloon that's named after a barnyard animal. The piano is blasting a ragtime tune as waiters bustle about, serving drinks to unruly cowboys that fill the establishment. In front of you are three unsavory characters, each more than the next. As the night goes on, so do the poker chips. And when one gentleman ain't taking kindly to his losses, some insults about each other's mothers are exchanged. A powerful slap reaches the man across the poker table, matching the energy of Will Smith on an Oscar night. <laughs> Too soon? I don't know. Wow, wow, West. Wow, 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 West. <laughs> That's when it's settled. Tomorrow at high noon, they're gonna settle this like gentlemen. A duel at noon with, with guns. That's, that's how they did it. Does it get any more classic than that? I don't think so, folks. The clock strikes noon, and only one outlaw remains. And he's married to Jada Smith. Number six, only talking. Ugh, here we go. You ever go to a bar, you're having a nice time, you and your pals order some Caesar salads for the table, the night is now well on its way. We're feeling good. Then 10 o'clock hits and you see a band 
start to set up. Okay, game time decision. Do we settle up and leave before they start? Or do we give them a chance, end up feeling bad, and feel obligated to stay until the very end at 3 a.m.? It's tough. Usually the latter ends up happening. Back in the 1800s, we didn't have to worry about such an issue. Most of the time, these saloons were just for business. The odd time you would have poker, dice, a piano, perhaps, would be in the room with some jazzy fingers making an appearance. But when saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time it was for lawmen, miners, gamblers, just, just pure business. Not many blind dates happening in booths 16, you know what I mean? Number five, mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis a lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, non-existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock he had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, actually used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold, just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today, and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, root and tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like a million ways to die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 50-50, both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure, a bit, just a little bit. Number three, barkeep. All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. I've never been to a Wild West rootin' tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like venom snake juice or whatever, like spider ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s, no karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. You don't have a mustache and a business plan, get out. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. Can you imagine that? In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy in a piano with some jazz fingers, sure. But most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up, in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty. Go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? I wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess. Not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, I remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next plague or the next toxin rolling through your system, they needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today, the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never. A resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showmen. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go. I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot? A fake show. I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. Do you have uh, strep throat? Come on up. Here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative, just a, just a mess. Just a 
show, really. So don't believe everything you hear, except for today. Today we're a bit smarter. Back then, not quite. Number 10, diseases. Dude, I had a toothache the other day, swelled up immediately. I would never have lasted in this era. Unfortunately, everyone, it wasn't called the mild, mild west. And when people were sick, they got sick, like sick, sick. For instance, cholera, shared along the Mormon and Oregon trails, killed loosely six to 12,000 people on their way to the California gold rush between 1849 and 1855. It's believed that more than 150,000 Americans died during the two pandemics from 1832 to 1849. Yo, that is terrifying. So not only do you have to dodge bears and root canals, just washing your face in the local popular stream could get you, huh? The Great Plains smallpox pandemic killed more than 17,000 Native Americans within its first few months of being there. The American Fur Company steamboat pulled up and got off, coughed a bunch of times, and then people just unfortunately started dropping. There was never an official death record as smallpox decimated the Americas when it arrived, both way, way back from the Spanish and then again from up north with the fur trade. Sneezing, coughing, everywhere, just cover your mouth, guys. You know? Number nine, kicked by a horse. Yeah, we've heard about this at some point in history, but did it actually happen? Like, how often was somebody just poofed and then that's it? Turns out getting kicked in the head by a horse back in the 1800s was like getting in a car accident. It was unfortunately, it, was, it happened pretty often, my friends. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Bill Pickett, just sounds like a Western man right off the hop. Bill Pickett was born in the late 1870s. He invented something called the bulldogging practice, which is to jump from the back of a horse onto a wild steer. Yeah, like you're Woody from Toy Story, just doing a heist, just jumping from one thing and leaping to the other. Crazy. While your hat's still on your head, somehow. No idea. And there's many that attempted this and ultimately failed. Yeah, you can't wrestle a wild animal and then live to tell about it often. I have read it. Yellowstone National Park is apparently a hotspot. This guy sends me a link the other day. Yellowstone National Park, man gored in front of family. I'm like, okay. But even Bill Pickett himself got trampled and stomped to death in 1932. Holbrook Lynn, a Broadway star from the late 1800s, also met their fate from a horse accident. Malcolm Baldridge Jr., an American politician from the late 80s, rodeo accident. Yeah, brutal way to go. Number eight, wildlife. The Wild West was a pretty harsh time. If you were lucky enough to enjoy some peace and quiet away from the saloons and bathhouses and spend some time outdoors with the family, well, then you had to be pretty careful. I mean, I guess most of the time people were outside, you know, fresh air, birds chirping, and of course an array of vicious and deadly predators overpopulated and hungry. Dude, the grizzlies are named after the grizzlies, right? Like imagine all those horses you had to wrangle or the gators of the south just waiting for you to take a leak or pecked to death by these huge birds of prey. If you didn't have a rifle on you, something could get you. And that's all during the day. At night, laying on the ground on like a rolled up t-shirt, scorpions and coyotes. What were the bugs like? No muscle back then, just waking up stung to absolute by everything with legs. Don't even get me started on the snakes. Living in your boots or hat? I'm a pretty outdoorsy guy, but god damn. Yep. Number seven, the gallows. We've mentioned the gallows many of times here on Bumblebee. It's almost like humans are consistently cruel throughout history or something like that. Odd. When it comes to meeting your fate in the Wild West, it sounds horrible to say, but with the rest of this list coming up, at least being hanged was fast. You know what I mean? And in the case of Tom Blackjack Ketchum, it was historical in a historically awful way. After a train robbery gone awry, or as I've said for 10 years, Ori, Tom Ketchum was held in prison until his date with the gallows arrived. But while waiting in prison, this man gained weight. The guy was eating good. He weighed around 200 pounds by the time of his demise. And dark detail here, but his body was so heavy when he was hanged that his head just kinda, you know, I don't wanna say anything here on YouTube, but like his head, that's all I'll say, just. Number six, topicals. If we know anything about doctors from history is that sometimes they didn't get it right. Most of the time, super, super helpful. And then like sometimes, yeah, I have a cough. Here's some ammonia. You, come on, you can trust me. Just call me doc. You know what I mean? Doctors in the mid 1800s, wild, wild west times were just like jarring and bottling everything up. Everything had a remedy. There were coaches that would just sell topicals and ailments. Hair loss, here you go. Sore legs, here you go. Tuberculosis, ooh yeah, sorry son, that's, uh, that's gonna kill you. We don't have a cream for that one. And tons of painkillers, of course, like opiates, morphine. Everyone's running around jonesing with cold sweats. 
Basically, you could just pull up to a remedies wagon and ask for either cocaine syrup or cannabis fluid or opium needles and be on your way. Every elixir, cure, and potion. This time literally went from medieval root canals to widespread vaccines in like 60 years. Cocaine leaves for headaches? Ooh, uh, I'll take that one, please. <laughs> Number five, gambler. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed to it big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft. That means another spin, baby! Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes. It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, what if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, con men. You'll like this one, guys. You're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made for the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, and as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and approved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved bigger supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, a photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild, wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the Old West, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String being in around to look for you, that's all I can say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy, who would've thought? First up, let's meet Pearl Hart. And let me start by saying that there's like three Pearls on this list. Wild West was a big fan of that name. And Pearl was a big fan of the Wild West. She was born in Canada around 1870, and by 17 she was married to a gambler and on the train to the Americas, running from her terrible father in a life of disguising herself as a boy to commit thefts to scrape by. At 22, she attempted to divorce said husband to pursue further opportunities in the West. 
Jazz. A total ride or die dandy, Pearl's husband upped his life to chase her down, and when he found her, Pearl was already living it up with cigarettes, liquor, and even morphine. He won her back, but only before being drafted. After her husband left to fight in the Spanish American War, Pearl, who was using her old cross dressing ruse to commit thefts and crimes alike, met a man named Joe Boot, who was a career criminal. They robbed stagecoaches for a while before she was caught and jailed. Hart is famous for saying, I shall not consent to be tried under a law in which my sex had no voice in making. She was eventually released, the jail having helped her find sobriety, new skills, a career, and how to read and write. But the rest of her life is kind of unknown. America was shocked and thrilled by the idea of a female outlaw, and Pearl earned endless infamy from the age of 19. And newspapers clamored for interviews with Hart, while Cosmopolitan, a new magazine at the time, was obsessed with her and often sent reporters to try and get quotes out of her. The Old West never saw another woman like her. And Pearl wasn't the only one taking advantage of male privilege. Meet Charlie Parkhurst. And from 1812 until their death in 1879, nobody knew Charlie was biologically a woman. There's no official documentation on what Charlie identified as personally. If they felt themselves to be a woman or non-binary or transgender, we'll never know. The story goes that while in the poorhouse as an orphan, Charlie discovered that boys have a great advantage over girls in the battle of life, and they desired to become a boy because of it. But what we do know is that times were rough for ladies in the wild west, so this Cracker Jack stagecoach driver decided to live most of their life as a man, driving stages for Wells Fargo and the California Stage Company, pulling cargoes of gold over tight mountain passes and open desert. A constant in danger from rattlesnakes and desperados. But Charlie had the balls for it. They're remembered as short and stocky, a hard drinker, cigar smoker, and tobacco chewer who wore an eye patch after being kicked in the left eye by a horse, thus their nickname one Eye Charlie. Using their secret identity, Charlie was also a registered voter, and meaning they may have been the first American woman to ever cast a ballot and nobody knew. After stagecoaching, industry began to die due to the railroads. Charlie lived out the rest of their life raising cattle and chickens until their death in 1879. It was then that their true identity was revealed, much to the surprise of their brooding and brutal friends. And then it was documented to the world in newspapers, many of which actually appreciated who they'd been in their secret, instead of belittling them in death. I'm sure Charlie would have loved to see that and know that. She's who you'd see in these old western films. Josephine Sarah Marcus, a smolderingly good looking actor born in 1861, Marcus ran away to Tombstone, Arizona while touring with a theater group performing Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. She stuck around to marry Sheriff John Banham. But two years later when notorious criminal Wyatt Earp showed up, well, her marriage went cold very coincidentally as she got all hot over tall, dark, and handsome Earp. Josephine and Earp fell in genuine love, and she'd supposedly be the reason behind the famous duel at the OK Corral, a 30 second flurry of gunfire involving the Wild West superstars Doc Holliday, the Clayton brothers, and of course, the Earps. He, unlike many, was unbothered and actually more intrigued by her Jewish heritage. The Earp Earps lived an okay life once they settled a bit, moving between mining and oil camps and eventually California to promote a movie about Wyatt Earp's lawman exploits. Unfortunately, Wyatt passes away before this is accomplished, leaving Josephine to battle it out with the studios and writers who take the original biography and turn it upside down. A commercialized depiction of her husband and an unflattering portrayal of her is released called Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshall. It came out in 1931 and fueled 50 years of Wyatt Earp mania, pro and con in print and film. Until she died, Josephine Josephine worked hard to have the correct documentation of her beloved life released. She passed away in 1944 and claimed until her dying day that Wyatt Earp was her one and only true love. Here's another one, Pearl DeVere. She is one of the most famous madams in history. This red haired siren was born in Indiana around 1860 and made her way to Colorado during the silver panic of 1893. DeVere told her family she was a dress designer, but in fact rose to fame as the Old Homestead, a luxurious brothel in Cripple Creek, Colorado. The price of a night stay could cost patrons $250, which at the time was insane, but more so in comparison to how most hotels at the time charged about $3 a night. The building was reportedly equipped with an intercom system and boasted fine carpets, imported furniture and drinks, and chandeliers. As beautiful as she was sharp, the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Daughter to Germanic mother and Native American father, Laura Bullion faced discrimination and inability to fit in right away. But that's okay, she followed her father in the footsteps of career criminal. And while working 
as an escort in Texas, she becomes involved with Will Carver, who had been her married in uncle until her aunt's recent demise. Now, widowed, Carver took 15 year old Laura to Utah with him, where he begins working with Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch in 1898, as does Laura. Laura Bullion helped the gang by fencing goods and money for them and was known to the group as Della Rose and often called the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Her affections also turned to Bill Kilpatrick, a member of the group, and they became lovers. Having taken part in several train robberies with the Wild Bunch, Kilpatrick and Bullion returned to Texas with William Carver, where Carver was ambushed and killed by lawmen on April 1st of 1901. Bullion and Kilpatrick then fled to St. Louis, Missouri, where they were arrested on November 8th of 1901. Kilpatrick was found guilty of robbery and sentenced to 15 years in prison, while Laura was sentenced to five. After serving three and a half of those years, Laura was released from Missouri State Penitentiary at Jefferson City, Missouri on September 19th of 1905 and lived the last years of her life in Memphis, Tennessee, under the name Freda Lincoln, where she was a seamstress and a dressmaker. She passed away on December 2nd, 1961, and is buried in Memphis under a tombstone that reads, Freda Bullion Lincoln, Laura Bullion, The Thorny Rose. The Wild West saloons were the pinnacle rest stop for travelers, gamblers, and drinkers alike. But how gross was the average Wild West saloon? The word comes from the French salon, and it originally had the same meaning, living room, as later on, saloon meant hall, especially one on a boat or a train. In 1800s America, it came to meaning public house or bar. Saloons in its establishment originated as a liquor house, as the first saloon was established at Browns Hole, Wyoming in 1822 to serve fur trappers. By 1880, the growth of saloons was in full swing. In Leavenworth, Kansas, there was about 150 saloons and four wholesale liquor houses. Some saloons in the Old West were a little more than casino, brothels, and illegal substance dens, as in the saloons of the Wild West, drinking was certainly a very popular activity, but there was more to it than just alcohol. Saloons often served foods, such as a simple meal or snacks, to accompany the drinks, as some saloons also hosted entertainment, such as live music, dancing, gambling, and even theatrical performances. But the food and drinks weren't always sanitary, as it was rare for one to come across clean water. So drinking whiskey was pretty super common, as well as beer and other forms of alcohol distilled. But aside the yeehaw and crime and punishments, there was also a lot of weird things in the wild west that aren't as jarring like how your bed would be full of squirrels. And I'm not saying like alive squirrels, although maybe. Some of the dead squirrels that they would find would be helpful to stuff your bed so it'd be a little softer when you stay the night. Also everyone smelled bad, really bad, considering there wasn't any forms of pipes or running water for miles, as water would be stagnant in the water towers and not a lot of filtration was made. The acidic and boracic acid smelling water would linger not just on you, but also on your clothes. If you were lucky, you might be able to bathe maybe once a week. As it took some time as well to warm up your bathtub, as heated water wasn't also available for the times. Other than these type of cleaning hygienics like bathing, when it came to oral care like brushing your teeth, people in the Old West used a variety of methods to clean their teeth. Some common practices include a toothbrush made out of animal hair or plant fibers, and brushing with a mixture of water and baking soda or salt. Chewing on twigs or rough cloths to rub their teeth were also very common methods, as health care like oral dental care often meant tooth extractions, as other aspects were pretty much a privilege of what we're having today that did not exist back then. As well as going to the outhouse was a more common thing than going to one in the saloon, as it would have probably stunk up the establishment and prevented customers from arriving. But that still didn't prevent people to do what the French did, which is to pee in a corner. So in the Old West, people would use a variety of materials for toilet paper, including leaves, corn cobs, newspapers, and even old catalog pages. Soft commercial produced toilet paper, as we are very privileged to know today, it didn't become very widely available until the late 19th century. And since they didn't have plumbing, as these outhouses were so common and gross, they stunk as they attracted many types of wildlife to slither their way in with you. They had bugs like black widows, and if you're extra unlucky, maybe even poisonous snakes. Also because of the trades of goods, of many were tobacco, spittoons were located everywhere. In almost every saloon, if not, you'd be finding yourself slipping on someone else's spit. Due to the widespread of the chewing tobacco in the 19th century, spittoons were a common fixture in public areas areas, including railroad stations. Their intended purposes was collecting tobacco juice spit from a distance, so typically they were built heavy and low to the ground. So with a wide mouth or funnel top, in the United States, public health departments launched an anti-spitting campaign to stop the spread of TB as it became more and more aggressive in smaller populated areas. Tuberculosis had forced some of these states as spitting to be illegal as it still is, and by the mid 20th century, spittoons were finally gone from most public spaces in the United States. I don't really think right now they still have spittoons, but that's gross. 
gross. Even the towels used to clean the bathroom and the bars at saloons were the same towels you'd wipe your face if you had too much beer foam. People kept spitting, and so it was so outlawed that because of the respiratory disease went rampant in the regions, if you kept spitting, you'd be charged with a $500 fine. But either way, the Wild West, from the daily politics to hygiene, times do be changing and the world keeps on spinning. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with, you know, four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner, obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the wild west here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California gold rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a doorstopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So. It's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course, outlaws, all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' shit. There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That was a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we've talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day, and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a Helena duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah. This it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. Number 10, boot hill burials. In the old west, many towns had a boot hill, which was essentially a graveyard where outlaws and bandits and all those bad people alike were all buried with their boots on. Specifically with 
put those on right there. See, these cemeteries were often lacking proper markings and the dead were buried quickly, sometimes a little too quick without a coffin, reflecting the harsh and lawless nature of frontier life. It wouldn't be abnormal to see a boot sticking up out of the ground on your way home from work is what I'm saying. Today that would be quite jarring, but back then, completely normal. How yucky is that? I'm like, oh, size 11 and a half? Perfect. Number nine, medical practices. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence. Obviously, uneven roads, hopping up and down horses, everything's made of wood that's all broken. Particularly among those who worked in physically demanding professions such as ranchers, miners, and cowboys, everything is gonna be broken on your body by the end of the day. Treatment options were limited and often relied on basic first aid techniques, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available. Wood, cloth, animal bones, it was nuts. It sounds crazy, but back then, it was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. You have to wrap another bone around it. It's like, ew, please, can I get a cleaner bone? Pain relief was only provided with natural remedies such as opium or willow bark tea, so, 50-50, what kind of night you're gonna have there. More serious fractures, such as those that punctured the skin, ow, those required the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, back then the doctor had like two teeth and one eye, so not much help. Number eight, duels. Ah, uh, yes, duels, let's talk about these. Duels, gotta say it all deep like. Duels were a common way to resolve disputes. Before YouTube comments, this was the only place to resolve any conflict, all right? In a traditional old Western duel, opponents would face each other, often with weapons, in front of a crowd at a designated location and time. Now, most of the time, these duels would end when somebody bites the bullet. Rarely would a duel end with two gentlemen shaking hands, you know, getting over their disagreements. No, never happened. These confrontations, often over matters of honor, were deadly and a normalized part of the culture. Number seven, law enforcement. That being said, back in the day, things were a little different. Not that many body cam back in those days, I'll tell you that for free. With a lack of formal law enforcement, communities often took justice into their own hands. They're like, oh yes, all 17 of us, we've decided, you're out of here. Vigilante coops would form to hunt down suspected criminals, often resulting in brutal forms of punishment without a formal trial. Yeah, no judges needed, no jury duty, nothing like that. The town ended the conflict in 48 Eight seconds. You're welcome. Let's get a beer. Let's get a really disgusting beer. Number six, public punishments. Now, when I say the town handled it, this is what I mean. We gotta go into detail here, because that's why I'm here. Public hangings were often treated as a social event with crowds gathering to watch as if it were entertainment. How disgusting is that? They were dressed to the nines, they grabbed the whole family. People would come from miles around, sometimes with picnics, to witness this brutal punishment. Yeah, picnic. What food do you pack for a hanging? Nothing with a crunch, that's for sure. You don't wanna ruin the show for the people around you. Number five, Mary Catherine Horony, also known as Big Nose Kate, was a historical figure associated with the American Old West as she was a Hungarian-born adult worker and companion to the legendary lawman and gambler Doc Holliday. Kate eventually moved to West and found herself in a rough and often lawless mining towns of the Old West as she worked as the Lady of the Night, gained notoriety for her feisty and independence personality. Kate then became romantically involved with John Henry Doc Holliday, a dentist turned gambler and gunfighter. What a career change. They met in Fort Griffin, Texas, in 1870s following Doc Holliday's death in 1887. Kate Haruni then lived in various places, including Arizona and Colorado. She then worked as a nurse and a hotel owner in the early 1900s, and Kate moved to Arizona and lived in poverty. She worked in various jobs, including serving as a cook, and then in 1930s, she applied and for received a pension for being a widow of a veteran American Indian War. Doc Holliday had happened to serve as a scout. Big Nose Kate then passed away on November 2nd, 1940 in Arizona at the age of 90, and she outlived many of the famous figures of the Old West. Number four, Bell Star. Born Myra Maybell Shirley, Bell Star was a notorious figure associated with the American Wild West during the 19th century. She became known as the Bandit Queen and gained notoriety for her associations with various outlaws and her involvement in criminal activities. Bell married several times, with her famous marriage being the outlaw Cole Younger, a former member of the James Younger Gang. After Younger, she then married Sam Starr, a Cherokee outlaw, which contributed to her connection with the Indian Territory, present day Oklahoma. Bell Star was also known to associate with herself with various outlaws, including Jesse James, the Younger Brothers, and the infamous Delta. Gang. Her connections to these outlaws and her involvements in horse theft and other legal activities contributed to her reputation. Bell Star and her husband Sam Star lived in the Indian Territory where they ran a horse ranch and their ranch became a haven for outlaws seeking refuge from the law. Bell Star was arrested several times for various offenses, including horse theft. However, she often managed to avoid lengthy imprisonments and her criminal activities continued. Bell Star's life came to a violent end when she was shot and killed on February 3rd in 1889 while riding home from a neighbor's house. The circumstances of her death remains somewhat of a mystery and the identity 
of the killer was never actually established. Belle Starr's life exploits became part of the Wild West folklore, and over the years, she had been portrayed in many books, films, and television shows, contributing to her enduring legend. Number three, Etta Place. Etta Place is one of the mysteries of the American Wild West, as her true identity and details of her life pretty much remains uncertain. She was associated with the famous outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, as we also know them, and is often considered to have been romantically involved with the Sundance Kid. Despite her connections to these historical figures, she is very little known about Etta, as Etta's place, true identity, and background are unclear. Her real name and place of birth and details about her early life are not actually known at all, and some historical sources suggest that she may have been born in the United States, while others propose that she could have just been European or South American origin. Etta Place is also best known for her association with Butch Cassidy, aka Robert Leroy Parker, and the Sundance Kid, whose actual name is Harry Alonzo Longabo, and she traveled with them during their exploits in South America, where they sought refuge to escape law enforcement in the United States. In the early 20th century, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kids, and Etta traveled to the South America, where they continued to life of crime, and they are believed to have engaged in bank and train robberies in countries like Argentina and Bolivia. The fate of Etta Place is uncertain, as some theories suggest that she may have perished alongside Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in a shootout with the Bolivian authorities. However, there is actually no conclusive evidence to support this theory, as there may be other theories that Etta Place's true identity, with some speculating that she may have had used multiple names during her lifetime. However, concrete evidence to confirm her background or provide clarity on her true identity is still undiscovered. Number two, born in France around 1829, Eleanor Dumont moved from the United States and became involved with the gambling industry known as the Gold Rush. She arrived in California during the Gold Rush of 1850, seeking opportunities in the Burgeon mining towns in 1854. Eleanor ended up opening a gambling establishment in Nevada City, California, where she ran gambling tables and her reputation for her skills as a car dealer. She then became known as Madame Moustache due to the fact that she had distinctive facial hair and refused to remove it despite societal expectations. And over the years, Madame Moustache opened and managed several gambling establishments in various mining towns, including Virginia City and Bodie. Despite her success in the gambling business, Eleanor faced financial challenges and struggled to maintain her enterprises. She suffered major losses and debts that ended up leading to her to a decline in her fortunes. And then Eleanor Dumont's life took a tragic turn, and as in 1879, facing financial difficulties and heartbreak, she took her own life by ingesting an overdose of really intense drugs in Bodie, California. Eleanor Dumont's story proves that a glimpse into the complexities of life during the gold rush and the challenges faced by women trying to make a living in a male-dominated society. Her role as a successful gambler and car dealer, as well as her refusal to conform to traditional gender norms, contribute to her place in the history of the American West. The nickname Madame Moustache and her distinctive facial features further add the colorful and unconventional aspects of her life. And finally, number one, Bonnie Parker was one half of the notorious criminal duo known as Bonnie and Clyde. Alongside Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker gained notoriety during the Great Depression for a series of bank robberies and criminal activities in the early 1930s. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas, and she grew up in a working class family and despite her small stature, developed a love for poetry and drama. Mm, I wonder if that's what caused her to join Clyde. Because she joined Clyde Barrow in January 1930. Clyde was already a seasoned criminal. A little bit of spice, a little paprika, was serving time in East End Prison Farm in Texas. A mutual acquaintance smuggled a weapon to Clyde and he used it to escape. Bonnie and Clyde embarked on a crime spree that included bank robberies, burglaries, and car thefts. They were involved in several pew pew outs with law enforcement and their criminal exploits attracted significant media attention. Bonnie and Clyde were often a part of criminal gang that included their other associates such as the Clyde brothers, Buck Barrow and his wife, Blanche Barrow. The gang engaged in violent confrontations with law enforcement, resulting in injuries and fatalities on both sides. Bonnie and Clyde gained additional notoriety due to photographs found by police at one of their hideouts, and the images depicted the couple posing with weapons, contributing to their image of glamorous and dangerous criminals. Bonnie and Clyde's crime spree came to a violent end on May 23, 1934, when the law enforcement officers ambushed their car near Benville Parish, Louisiana. The officers fired a barrage of bullets, killing both Bonnie and Clyde instantly, and the story of Bonnie and Clyde has become a part of American folklore. Their criminal exploits and romanticized in the media have been a subject of numerous books, films, and songs, and the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway further cemented their status as infamous figures. Kicking off the list at number 10, medicine shows. Nowadays, medical shows are fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I can weirdly watch that all day. There's something about animal rescues, home renovations, or chiropractic adjustments, you know, I can never be bored. So back in the wild, wild west, the 1860s to the 1890s, they had medicinal showmen. Yeah, these guys would go town to town, of course, selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail this pitch. They would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience for these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient, and then boom, just like that, they would be 
cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was an elixir made by Kickapoo Indian Medicines from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any illness, but really it was more of just a laxative, so you were just in the bush and hoping it got better. Number nine, hop on my camel, partner. When you think of the Old West, you think long open ranges, spurs on boots, and cowboys riding camels? That's right, in 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels to Texas. After all, the terrain in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when the American Civil War broke out. Eventually, the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends, such as the Red Ghost, a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their britches. When in reality, most people had never seen a camel before, and it was just a feral camel wandering the desert. But I mean, who knows? If Star Wars had a 30 foot camel in the snow, what's to say there isn't one running around in the American desert? Number eight, Missing Minds. There's billions of dollars worth of gold lost at the bottom of the sea. It's there right now, waiting for you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. But if you don't have goggles, maybe swimming just isn't your thing. No sweat. Try the West. Yeah, there's dozens of lost treasure troves hidden in mines still to this day, like the San Saba gold mine or the wheelbarrow mine. There's a few we have heard from in literature from old maps, but none compared to the lost Dutchman mine. The legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, found the richest gold mine in the world. That's what he told his friends. And would we ever lie to our friends about gold and the location for it? No, absolutely not. The first gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock, had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father used it as a doorstopper. Yeah, they used a 17 pound gold nugget as a doorstopper, nice. Back then, this information was game changing once they realized that it was, you know, gold. So Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right afterwards. I just wouldn't have told anybody. I'd be like, is this an affinity stone? I'm just gonna pocket this and then head out east. Head out east. Number seven, Sideshow Crook. Elmer McCurdy was no different in life than any other bandit at the time. What makes McCurdy so unique is in his afterlife. McCurdy met his end on October 7th, 1911, after local sheriffs tracked him down from a botched robbery. McCurdy was taken to an undertaker and prepared for burial. Unfortunately, no one came to claim the lonesome bandit. Not getting paid for his services, the undertaker began to display McCurdy as a sideshow attraction, charging patrons a nickel to view the bandit. The attraction became popular enough to draw the attention of carnival promoters, who offered multiple times of the mummified crook, but were all denied. As the years went on, McCurdy changed hands from multiple sideshow attractions and museums. One day in 1976, a film crew was setting up props for a filming. When someone began to move what they thought was a wax mannequin, it actually turned out to be poor old Elmer McCurdy himself. Eventually, McCurdy was laid to rest in a grave, where two feet of concrete were poured over his casket to make sure no one would come to steal the sideshow crook. Stay in the hole, partner. Number six, cowboys and aliens. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico back in 1947, aliens might have actually visited us. Yeah, the report comes from 1896 from two men in California. They reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Were these just cowboy pranksters? Maybe they had a few shots of whiskey from the saloon? No, one of them was a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which honestly sounds like a wonderful time, just saying that. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender, Aliens. Yeah, the aliens didn't end up taking the two men because they were too heavy. These aliens were too thin and weak. Legit, that was the reason. They just couldn't grab them and take off. So they got back into their spaceship and they took off. How embarrassing is that? Hit the gym, ET. Number five, comfort of the ladies of the evening. Now being that it's the old west and there was just a shootout in the street, folks need to take their minds off of such horrors. Add into the mix long hard days, tending fields and livestock, people need to take off some steam. The local saloon is there for that. However, like a hidden menu at McDonald's, there's some other activities a man can engage in that aren't perhaps a regular service. Aw, oh, who the hell am I kidding? Ladies of the evening were quite common back then, actually. Naturally, it was a very dangerous job. However, if anything good can come from that, it's that in some cases, these women became very wealthy, wealthy enough to become the madam of their own establishments. And in some other cases, these madams were using their wealth to invest back into their towns, like building schools, doctor's offices. Imagine getting treatment from something and the doctor says, these bandages were brought to you by Madame Dover's Wicked Wizard Vacuum Double Sloshy Slush 9000. It's a great product, what can you say? Number four, interior decor. We've seen a Western saloon in movies. More often than not, it's the swinging door. You know, the classic, 
They always kick it in, whoom, and dust everywhere and all over the place. Dust gets all on people's meals, the classic. You sort of need to kick those doors open kind of also, because if you go through slow, it's just weird. It like pushes your clothes back. You need that cowboy momentum. In reality, there weren't a lot of swinging saloon doors. In fact, most saloons across the West were in pretty rough shape. They didn't look like a Tarantino set at all. They looked like that one pub in that one town that one time, you know? Just not clean, not clean at all. You ride by, you're like, is that still open? How is that still open? These saloons were tiny rooms. We had stools or chairs made of fur. You know, no one's running fish tacos to tables in the 1850s. It doesn't always smell like a nice pub. You don't see something go by and you go, ooh, what's that? I wanna have that. No, that doesn't happen here. One of the fanciest saloons has to be the White Elephant in Fort Worth, Texas. It was two stories and it served fresh fish and oysters. Apparently it was a lovely time. Number three, manifest destiny. The destiny of America. There's a famous poster somewhere. It's like an angel guiding the pioneers west. It's like pointing, doing something like that. Back to the history. What is manifest destiny? Well, for our non-American audience, it was this very core belief that since America had won its independence and begun expanding west, that they were destined to do so and keep expanding and expanding. Why should the freedom train stop here, right? Coast to coast, baby. And maybe buy Alaska from Russia, since, well, they're not really using it. Okay, and maybe Hawaii. They, they got pineapples or something, I don't know. All right, maybe even heavily influenced places that are beyond US borders. But all that American influence and imperialism starts here. Imagine being the pioneer who dared to venture west, like the Great Oregon Trail, or those who crossed the desert states. And some really religious folks that found a salty lake in the desert looked at their wives and said, eh, I need at least two or three more. God bless America. Number two, mixologist. You ever go to a pub, like a chill pub, dare I say a restaurant, and a dude with a mustache thinks he's in Peaky Blinders for no reason behind the bar? He's flipping bottles that don't need to be flipped. He's lighting shots on fire. Guy, it's 12.45 in the afternoon. What's your soup of the day? Where did this come from, historically? Where did the cool bartender role come from? I'm trying to order a Cosmo, but he won't stop doing stunts. In the 1800s, bartenders were referred to as mixologists. <sighs> Uh, they were top dog. They had to be. They were the fanciest guys in town. We're now doing impressions of these guys today, you know, with the bow tie and we pour it in fancy ways, because around the late 1800s, saloon owners were growing rapidly. So now you needed to have something special, something unique for the town. Like say, a witty mixologist who can twirl his mustache as he pours a drink without looking. Great, now the town feels special, it feels unique. Manuals for bartenders came out around the 1860s, that's when things started to get more serious. A gentleman named Jerry Thomas published a guide called How to Mix All Kinds of Plain and Fancy Drinks. Today we still have that, but now it's a red sticky binder that says meal specs and Sharpie. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Number one, dysentery. Nothing is more horrible, more awful than catching dysentery. Trust me, I would know. I never caught it, I just, sometimes I get diarrhea. Anyway, in Oregon Trail, the very charming DOS game. Gotta love that DOS color palette. Eye melting scion and violet. Nice. This text based adventure game, however, is grounded in some truth, as we can all imagine this wasn't a time of great cleanliness. Dysentery, typhoid, cholera, malaria, or more commonly known as yellow fever, and even scurvy which you usually associate that with pirates, but cowboys got it too. Which, given the conditions of the Old West, makes for a not so fruit friendly environment. So yeah, it does make sense. Sadly for cowboys, prospectors, and everyone in between, there was a good chance you would lay down with a headache and then the rest of your posse would have to lay you down forever. In the ground, partner. Starting our list off at number 10, a banker. Today, online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times. I don't know. I get an email from my bank. It's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like, chill, relax. Back in the old west, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? 
Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache, oh hello sir, good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild, I get it now, I get it, the wild west. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed, be thankful. They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, ranch work. Alrighty, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earned between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit, less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not, they probably just get sick. Number eight, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the old west that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad, you know? Who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad. That is exhausting. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads. It checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix this wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah, yeah, even though there are only 465 residents, there are five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long, so I get it. The industry provided jobs as well. It's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure, so when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Number five, weather. Weather, you wanna believe it or not. Try again. Back in the 1800s, obviously weather was a major factor as it is today. Hailstorms, lightning, high winds. When you're a cowboy, this all sucks even more, honestly. Especially the opposite, when it's dry and humid for weeks at a time. Check this out. Wooden wagon wheels would actually shrink because of the heat. So they had to be soaked overnight just to prevent the iron rims from falling off during your commute during day hours. Yeah, it was so dry the wagon wheels needed water. Yeah, sorry I'm late, my wagon wheels were a little thirsty. Yeah, I had to wait for them to soak up some fun. I can't even drive a car downtown without having a panic attack today, let alone rubbing axle grease on my dry lips waiting for my wheel to drink water. Number four, gangs. If you've played the Red Dead Redemption series, then you've probably held up a train or two. Some of the posses that were famous at the time actually did that though, and weren't so nice about it. The American West was made up of criminal outfits, usually a gang or a posse, involving members who would just live and ride and rob together with. Jobs were scarce, and it seemed that it was just a little easier to just demand what you want, and then enjoy the birth of all the media attention after, making some quote, famous. An obsession, the cowboy culture, the outlaw criminal. Some of them include Billy the Kid's gang, the High Fives gang, and the Oklahoma Braves. That's a good one. 
Artists were getting better at the time and people were sketching wanted lists for local sheriffs. These posters would be calling cards for these guys. They kept them, put them in their pockets as souvenirs. Charles E. Bowles, also known as Black Bart, held up a total of 28 stagecoaches without ever being caught, and even had the reputation of being a gentleman about it too, emptying strong boxes but never actually shaking down the passengers. There were even reports that he would even leave verses of poetry behind. Guy's a smooth criminal, huh? Number three, the night after. I'm sure the wild, wild west was wildly lonely. Definitely, this isn't news. Like Kyle said, we've played Red Dead Redemption, just wandering around alone. Sometimes you need more than a train heist, right? Sometimes you need love, even if you have to pay for it with railroad bonds or whatever. Saloons have all the things a lone traveler could want, including STIs. Great, how much is, uh, great, debit. We'll just pay for all this in one swift. Tap, I guess. The famous wild Bill Hickok, okay? He had a rough go. Guy had some troubles after a few saloons, okay? He was dipping around in a few bars and uh, yeah. Alexander Fleming wasn't born until five years later in 1881, so penicillin wasn't around to save any cowboys at this time. Number two, battles. The archetype of the Old West period is generally accepted by historians to have occurred between the end of the American Civil War in 1865 till about 1890. The American frontier, also known as the Wild West, is the geography, history, folklore, and culture associated with the American expansion mainland that settlers started in the 17th century and ended in 1912. This era, giving rise to the expansionist attitude known as Manifest Destiny, which was the belief that Americans were supposed to travel and expand west. But with that came a lot of conflict. You can't just waltz in and throw up a house when someone else lives there already, you know? Years of warring tribes and bands, colonist battles, ego-filled duels, and the aggressive pillaging of land stolen took countless number of lives. Yeah, countless, like countless, like we'll never actually know the accurate number. Roughly 750,000 lives were lost in the Civil War. Yeah, nasty stuff. And finally, number one, Helena duels. Beginning, of course, in Helena, Texas, Helena duels were Violent, awful. This activity came from what was then the toughest town on earth. And again, this is back in the late 1800s, so what that even means, I can't even compare. The Hell in a Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. It's not a great movie, but it's a history lesson in itself. A Hell in a Duel puts our opponents' left hands tied together, right? They're just tied together with buckskin or something that smells awful, and you have to just fight each other using one arm. Now, of course, in Western fashion, there is a weapon or two involved that I don't want to get too deep into on YouTube, so it got pretty gory, it got pretty violent. The only rule here was that they can't bleed too much. Awesome, that's a great fun rule, like whipping that one out on Saturdays. Hey, no one bleed too much or else, you know, then we gotta stop. I thought UFC was brutal, let alone a Hell in a Duel starring Liam Hemsworth, of all people. Really? Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo & Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9, Gravedigger. What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants sand and folks would probably end up in the ground or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a grave digger busy for days. However, I thank the grave diggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the ones from Hamlet, those guys are pretty weird actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. 
Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to 1, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kinda wanna be a barkeep now. Number seven, lady of the evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Whew. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings. That kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but she gets shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home, Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kind of guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business, where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me, at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Next, Mary Ellen Pleasant, the most powerful black woman in the Golden Rush era. Historians indicate that Pleasant was most likely born a slave, but got her freedom at an early age. She worked on the Underground Railroad as a young adult, ushering enslaved people out of the South and into the Northern states. Like many others seeking their fortunes during the Gold Rush, Pleasant and her husband moved to San Francisco. Here, she works as a cook and waitress and a professional eavesdropper. I know we're all taught not to be nosy, but Mary Ellen learned from the conversations of wealthy patrons, intentionally listening in for valuable information. She took what she learned and began applying it as banking and monetary skills that launched her immediately upwards. She took what she learned to help build a substantial fortune and eventually became one of the richest women in the city. Pleasant was an astute investor whose portfolio included real estate, railroads, restaurants, boarding houses. Pleasant's wealth, however, could not shield her from racism. In 1866, a streetcar conductor in San Francisco refused to let her board because she was black. Outraged, Mary Ellen sued and the case went all the the way to the California Supreme Court. In a historic decision, the courts ruled that segregation on streetcars was illegal in California. However, in return, the Supreme Court reversed the damages Pleasant had been awarded in a lower court ruling. You win some, you lose some, and sometimes you get both. And now it's Donna Barcello. Described as the supreme queen of refinement and fashion, Donna Barcello was a prominent saloon owner and a professional gambler in Santa Fe in the 1830s and 1840s. Barcello was recognized for her charm and sharp business skills, which helped her establish as an influential member of high society during the heyday of the Santa Fe Trail. In 1835, Barcella opened a hotel and casino in the city center of Santa Fe. The establishment encompassed an entire city block and featured lavish decorations including chandeliers, drapes, mirrors, and imported furnishings. The casino became a destination for local socialites and trail travelers for its opulence. Barcella oversaw the casino's operations and regaled patrons as one of the card dealers, widely known as the best dealer of the card game Monty across the entire Southwest. 
seeking trade deals and investments that increased her wealth and social status, exercised economic and political sway, she made her fortune from real estate and gold ventures in addition to her casino. And when the American civilian government established itself in Santa Fe during the Mexican American War in 1846, Barcella allied herself with Americans and assisted them by providing information and at times money. Accounts and representation of Barcella were often embellished by those who had labeled her the Queen of Sin. Barcella continued to operate her casino through the 1840s and died in January of 1852. Upon her death, she left several residences, properties, and fortune to her family, including two adopted daughters, in addition to substantial contributions to the Catholic Church and the city of Santa Fe to be used for charitable endeavors. Next up is Sing Choi. She's also known by the name China Mary and was an unofficial leader of Tombstone's Chinese community in the 1880s who supplied labor and opened laundries, restaurants, gambling halls, dens, and a general store. The Old West will always be remembered as an era of cowboy, but during its peak years, Tombstone was actually controlled by a female immigrant. She arrived in Tombstone sometime around 1879, and at that time, the Chinese population was 11 people, and she recognized the unprecedented profits waiting in the western boom towns. Mary's general store was in the center of Hoptown, a Chinese district of Tombstone. Mary's store dealt in both American and Chinese merchandise, and she gained a reputation as a universal accommodator. Everyone knew that nothing in Hoptown was done without China Mary's go ahead, and so she was held in the highest of esteem throughout Tombstone society. She was an organized and shrewd business operator who had an attitude that discourse was bad for business. Her private police force handled any problem that arose within her community. Mary enjoyed the highest of respect. As a result, she could act as a sort of intermediary between her community and other ethnic groups. She was the conduit that made cooperation possible. She was not only a cunning businesswoman, but a sympathetic humanitarian and calculating capitalist. Mary was a genuine immigrant success story. Even, even as a woman in the Old West, she wielded real power. She died in December of 1906 from heart failure when she was 67. Flesh is in the name and it's her game, Susan La Flesh. This is the story of the first Native American to earn a medical degree. Born on an Omaha res in Nebraska, as a young girl, she watched a sick indigenous woman wait all night for a white doctor who, after being called several times, just never came. The woman died the next day, and as Susan later wrote, she saw the need of my people for a good physician. Susan's father taught her her own culture and traditions and then sent her to the reservation's Presbyterian school where she learned English and then high school for further education to survive colonial society. She applies to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. It's a bold move on her part because even during this time, the most privileged of white women of America faced enormous backlash when attempting a medical degree, let alone a poor native girl. Despite this, she graduated a year early and first in her class. Rejecting a potentially comfortable life on the East Coast, she returns to the Omaha reservation and became the sole doctor for more than 1,200 people across 400 plus miles, and she was only 24 years old. She marries, she has two kids, and she never stops. In fact, she keeps going till she has enough donations and supplies to open the first hospital on a reservation that was not funded by the government. Unlike the absent doctor that she remembered from her childhood, Susan helped anyone who needed it, regardless of race or ethnicity. On September 18th of 1915, Susan passes away. She worked hard to build a bridge between two worlds as her father advised, and it was evident at her funeral. Three priests eulogized her, but it was a member of the Omaha tribe who delivered the final words in the Omaha language. And now for the last lady on the list, Kathy Williams, who also went in reverse as Williams Cafe from 1866 to 1868 with the famed Buffalo Soldiers who patrolled the 900 mile Santa Fe Trail. She was the first African American female soldier to enlist in the army. She's the only documented black woman to serve in the army in the 19th century, and she's the only known black female soldier to be a part of the Buffalo Soldiers. Post war job opportunities for newly freed slaves and for African Americans in general were non existent, so many had no choice but to turn to the military service for employment stability, but also newfound access to health care, education, post war benefits by way of pension. Her enlistment starts in November of 1866 in St. Louis, Missouri. A cursory examination by an army surgeon should have outed Williams as a woman, but since the army didn't require full medical exams at the time, she was minty. Eventually, her third round with smallpox has a surgeon discover her secret in 1868. The post surgeon found out I was a woman and I got my discharge. The men all wanted to get rid of me after they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me, Williams said. Once again, dressed as a man, Williams signed up to an emerging all black regime, the 38th US Infantry, which would eventually become part of the legendary Buffalo Soldiers. These units doted out the landscape of the American West and showed tremendous skill and valor in a range of duties. They fought in skirmishes with indigenous people, escorted vulnerable wagon trains, built forts, 
to map the territory, protected white settlers, all with subpar equipment and a lot of racism towards them. In trying to make a life for herself, Williams could not have known her story had traveled. It landed with a St. Louis reporter and in January 2nd of 1876, edition of the St. Louis Times Daily, Williams officially became a headline when her story was published. Accounts say she died in 1893, shortly after being denied disability compensation required for her illness. Not for being undeserving of it, but simply because they couldn't grant it to her due to the fact she lied about being a man. Cowboys and cowgirls of the Wild West era weren't just fashion trendsetters, but their choices of accessories served a dual purposes of practicality and hygiene wise. Bandanas often provided protections against the gritty winds and scorching suns, and there's also another hidden benefit. In a time when the access to clean water and regular bathing was very limited, personal hygiene practices weren't always up to par, so the bandana, often worn around the neck or face, acted as a makeshift shield. Not only did they safeguard against dust, but they also aided in reducing the spread of germs and unpleasant odors that people so commonly came across the rugged days of the Wild West. And also if you smelled, at least they can cover it up. In the Wild West, alcohol fueled bar brawls were common, often escalating to very dangerous levels. The infamous fire water, a potential mix of burnt sugar, alcohol, and chewing tobacco, frequently ignited tempers over trivial matters. While many brawls resulted in minor injuries, some spiraled into deadly conflicts. This volatile environment where a simple disagreement could lead to lethal outcomes paint a vivid picture of the lawlessness and rough justice that characterized the era. The prevalence of such violent encounters in saloons highlighted the harsh realities of life in the Wild West, where disputes were often settled with fists or weapons rather than words, underscoring the perilous nature of social interactions during this time. In the 1800s, diseases like cholera, as I mentioned, was a major cause of death in the American frontier. The necessity to prioritize drinking water over uses like laundry and dishwashing exasperated the risk of disease outbreaks, so cholera in particular claimed thousands of lives affected in both settlers and indigenous populations. The arrival of European settlers in the Americas had a catastrophic impact on Native American populations, primarily due to the introduction of diseases like smallpox, measles, and influenza. Native Americans had no prior exposure or immunity to these diseases, and they had suffered devastating losses, with some estimates indicating a reduction of up to 90% in their populations. This tragic aspect of colonial expansion underscores the lethal impact of infectious diseases in populations without natural immunity, highlighting one of the most significant and tragic consequences of the European settlement of the Americas. This grim reality of the frontier life underscores the vulnerability of populations to common diseases in the absence of modern sanitation and medical knowledge. It highlights the precariousness of life during this period, where everyday resources and practices could also mean the difference between health and widespread illness. The westward expansion of settlers under the banner of Manifest Destiny had a significant health implication. As they veneered into new territories, they encountered unfamiliar diseases to which they had little immunity due to poor living conditions. This exposure to new pathogens posed a significant health risk, often overwhelming their already compromised immune systems, and this aspect of frontier expansion highlights the unintended consequences of exploration and settlement on the health of the settlers, revealing the challenges and dangers they faced in unfamiliar environments. Hospitals in the 1800s, prior to the understanding of bacteria, often did much harm than good. The lack of sterilization of medical instruments in close patient quarters facilitated the rapid spread of diseases. These medical facilities intended for healing unironically or ironically became hotspots for infections and diseases transmissions. The conditions in these early hospitals reflected the limited medical knowledge of the time and the challenges of providing healthcare in an era unaware of basic hygiene principles. It illustrates the paradox of places designed for healing inadvertently becoming centers of illnesses, a stark contrast to the sanitized medical environments of today. Despite the advancements of medical science, some rural doctors in the 1800s continued to use leeches for bloodletting based on the outdated belief that diseases were caused by excess blood. This practice largely abandoned by academic physicians persisted in smaller towns highlighting the discrepancies in medical knowledge and practices across different regions. The continued use of leech therapy in some areas served as a reminder of the slow decimation of medical knowledge and the persistence of traditional practices even in the face of emerging scientific understanding. There was a time of course a terrifying epidemic known as syphilis swept through a population like wildfire. In a quest for a remedy, medical professions turned into a substance that hold the key. Mercury. Despite the severe side effects, patients endured a grueling routine of daily applications of mercury ointment. Ugh, this reckless treatment could last for years while unleashing many horrors upon the afflicted. However, people who are convinced the treatment was worth it, I guess now we wouldn't practice it the same, but at least we got better in self-care compared to parts of history.